I have no name, no identity. I am nothing. I spit upon those who created me. I will fight those who oppress me. I will fight alone to destroy the scourge. I will fight until I die. A new religion burns in my veins. All hail the gods of war. So here we are sitting in a seriously beautiful location. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> this is, I mean, the reason I wanted to start doing some of these conversations, documentaries, films, not quite named what they are yet, is because I go to a lot of press panels, listen to a lot of interviews, and they're always, so this film that you did, what did this role mean? I want to get to know you, Tracy, a little bit better and try and ask you questions, not like an interview thing, but just have a conversation that happens to be recorded by a camera mm -hmm. and an audio device. Are you a fan of press junkets and being on panels? Um, I like it all. You know, it's, to me that's a relief of work. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what was the first panel that you were ever on. Oh, I haven't been on a panel myself. No. Not on a panel, but the press stuff. I mean, I've done a gazillion press, but um, no, I've never been on a panel. Well, I will be soon with Rogue Warrior, but um, no. I've, I've attended a lot of them. I've been there for other people, you know. Um, but I, you know, I have talked a lot publicly on TV, been interviewed on TV and a million times video and lots of you know, magazine videos and things like that. I'm used to it because I also used to interview other people. I was on a television show for six years called The Million Dollar Showcase of Homes. And I was 20s. And um, so I interviewed other people. And so it's really, really easy to be on the other side once you've been in those shoes. Does it make you cringe a little bit because you've done so many interviews other people when somebody interviews you and you're like, oh, what did you have to have? Yeah. yeah. Every now and then, there's a couple, most of the time it's like when something's like really long ago, and I understand it because it's, it's like their favorite shows and their favorite this and their favorite that, and to me it's like, why are we going back decades, you know, it's like, let's talk about the now, it's so much more exciting, you know, but I do understand it, and I had to have it explained to me, like, why do they keep going there, and, and then people say, well, that might be their favorite show, maybe those are their favorite things that they've seen, maybe that's when they first saw you as an actress and started watching what you do, and then I was like, oh, okay, and then I won't be so bad about that, but that used to drive me nuts, but now that I understand it, you know. It doesn't drive you nuts anymore. No, because you really, one of the reasons you do press and, and that you talk to people is because it makes them happy, and then they want to come see your stuff, and I love it when people come and meet me when we go to places or have premieres, and they follow you on social media, and... I'm not the person that gets creeped out by that. I'm the person that's like, oh, hey, we haven't done a red carpet at this one. Come on, you know, <laughs> it's like, because I think it's fun. And I love that people love to watch the different, because I do different genres and they love to see the, the variances in what I do. And to me, that's really fun. What is your, have you got a favorite genre or do you just like mixing it up and doing everything? Um, I'm going to answer that in two ways. <laughs> one is, of course, my favorite genre has always been science fiction. Growing up, you know, my dad was a Trekkie, and we snuck out late at night after mom went to bed, and he'd let us sit next to him, and we'd eat Baki Road ice cream and watch Star Trek and, and um, you know, Planet of the Apes and Logan's Run. And, I mean, the whole gamut of all those shows. I mean, we watched as kids. And I actually saw Star Wars before it even came out in the theater because one of my neighbors, um, the kid that I hung out with, his dad was one of the producers. And they had a theater in their house back when nobody had theaters in their houses. And so we walked past all these Star Trek statues and everything and went downstairs and watched Star Wars, going, hmm, what was that? That was pretty cool, you know? But that said, science fiction is my favorite to perform in, too. But I love the different genres. I love comedy beats. I just love, just, I love the pace and the fastness, and I love the fact that you just roll with it. It just comes out of you. Science fiction, I mean, you are using your mind, your imagination, your physicality. You're using so many different aspects of, of your being that it's challenging. And I love being challenged and some of the most fun I've ever had. No bruises so much on comedy films. No, so no bruises at all. <laughs> yeah, luckily I did the comedy before I did the science fiction this year. <laughs> I mean, is, is it commonplace to get injured on a film set? It just get knocks about and, and stuff. Not in a bad way, but you know, and bruises and. and not usually. No. You know, it's just I really wanted to do my own stunts, and I really wanted to do everything. And I and I, I will never say no on set. 
I'm that person, so I'm dying, and they're like, will you do it one more time? Yeah. And if I possibly physically can, yeah, I'll keep doing it because I want it to look that good, and I know what the difference is and how many takes you do and how many angles you do and how hard you work. And and so, yeah, but, but I didn't mind the bruises and the injuries so much because I was so proud of myself. You know, it's like, yeah, I thought I could do that. I did do that, but I did it 10 times. I did it 20 times. I did it over and over and over, you know, and yeah, that's pretty amazing. How are you watching your own films back again? Because a lot of people speak to you and like, do you watch your own films? I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. They, they just don't seem to enjoy I... watching your own movies back again. I've worked with actors who are that way too, and when we're watching playback during filming, they'll be like, oh, no, I don't watch my own stuff. And it's like, really? But, like, I just went to the premiere of Who's Jenna, and um, I was sitting in the audience, and it's a kind of a funny story, because I remember, I, I watch it as a character. So when I'm, when I'm doing it, I'm living it as me, but when I watch it, I'm watching it as a character. That's just, I enjoy the performance. I don't sit there and think about that it's me. And there's this one scene where it's just a lot of dialogue, da 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 da, da very good t comedy beats, and it's very fast and stuff. And I remember thinking to myself, guy, how did she do that? That's really tricky. And then I'm like, oh yeah, that's my character. <laughs> you know? So I separate from it that much. Mm -hmm. Just like I separate from my media persona that much. It's like, because you know, people carry on and everything. Well, to me, that's the image that I portray. It's, you know, I don't take it all personally. Yeah. Positive okay. or negative. Yeah, I don't like to science fiction. <laughs> mm -hmm. Rogue fighter. Rogue Warrior, yeah. Rogue Warrior. I always get that. Well, that's gonna, because it's I'm Rogue gonna, Warrior, I'm Robot gonna, Fighter, gonna, so it's confusing. I'm going to turn to Neil and say, the amount of times I've got that title wrong, and there was one yeah. podcast when I was trying to tell John Fouts, and I'm like, I'm, I'm not the saying the title, because I'm going to get it wrong. <laughs> For some reason, because I've got four words, and I keep getting them mixed up. And uh, well, originally it was Robot Fighter, and then was something else, and something else, and Robot Armageddon, and Robot Apocalypse, yeah. and then it was Rogue <laughs> Warrior, and then... We liked it because it was just sound like Road Warrior. It did, I think that's why I keep getting yeah. confused up. So I'm like, that's not it because it's not like that one. So well, if you say it's totally it different. <laughs> <laughs> really say it fast. I've got a straight accent. I, I did a movie called Road Warrior. Yeah. You know, <laughs> oh, it, was, it was actually in the description of Sienna's character. And the sales agent was saying to Neil, he's saying, you know, well, we really need a stronger name for it than Robot Fighter because this is a big film, mm -hmm. you know. And um, couldn't think of anything passing, you know, lists and lists and lists. And then he goes, well, actually, in the description, it says Sienna is a rogue warrior. And he goes, what about rogue warrior? We're like, oh, that's awesome. We like that. And then, of course, everything else rogue started happening. We're yeah, like, rogue we got it first. We were there. <laughs> it's rogue like, warrior and fury roll. Mm -hmm. It's funny because when people do <laughs> interviews, especially podcast interviews, they'll go, um, and rogue warrior, robot fighter, and every time they get it right, because they usually don't get it right, I'll be like, yay, you got it right. <laughs> I just get it wrong so often. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember consciously when I was on a podcast, knowing that director Neil mm -hmm. listens to that show, and I'm like, I'm going to get it wrong. Well, oh, because it's a Neil Johnson podcast, it's a Neil right? Johnson podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Hot chick on a burning planet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I, I told John Fox, I think, it's during the show, I'm like, Tracy, just listen. <laughs> and I'm not putting it out because I don't tend to edit stuff out. So, so funny. Glitches can just be pure comedy gold or embarrass you or whatever. So well, it was so funny thing. because then I I had commented on it on, on Twitter and then you sent me a message like three seconds after I'd commented on it. So it was really funny. Yeah, yeah John went red. Yeah, good. So, <laughs> yeah, I always leave stuff like this in because it's real comedy. It's funny. Oh, it is. It's funny. People are like, right, you've got to film wrong and mm -hmm. leaving or whatever so um, I mean we've covered a lot of Comic Con stuff we did it which was yes. an experience with Comic Con mm -hmm. um, what excites you about the film world not as a person in them or making them but mm -hmm. movies generally nowadays do you watch a lot of films at the cinema or, or Blu-ray or DVD or? we watch a lot of movies we watch movies you know while we work at night and we watch TV shows serial watch them you know go through whole episodes in a row and um, I not only love entertaining, but I love being entertained. And I love seeing what other people do with it. And, and I love when I watch a movie and there's those actors that put the same kind of effort into it that I do. And there's a few of them, and I'd say only a few, that I think actually work harder than I do. And then I learn from what they're doing. And I'm, like, oh. I'm always upping my game, you know, but I, I think that I feed off of what other people do. And um, I feed off of the stories, and I get very, very lost in them. So yeah. What are some of your favorite shows? I will ask you to name the people because they'll get egotistical. What are some of your favorite shows? I'll tell you about the people too because they won't get egotistical. Um, 
we're obsessed right now with Doctor Who. I mean, I'm so obsessed. It's like we'll watch two episodes, and I like, I need to watch one more. I need one more. I need one, except for the Weeping Angels. Yeah. Nah. But um, completely obsessed with that. And we watch a lot of movies, and we watch overwatch things. Um, I wish I could remember the name of that one that I just watched recently that I got off of the shelf. Do you remember that? Uh huh. Can't remember. Oh my. No, it was four hours long, and I watched it with Brenda while you were gone. Oh, I don't know. Oh, I wish I could remember. It was brilliant. It was brilliant. Oh, no, I'll think of it, and then we'll bring it back up. No, it wasn't. It was... No, it was fighting, and... Yeah. Something revisited. Oh, Alexander. Alexander revisited. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah, I've seen stone. three versions of that. I've not seen I watched the longest one. The yet, longest the one. And I went into it because, you know, there's periods in my life where I'm working a lot. And I miss everything that comes out because I'm completely obsessed with prepping. I'm, I'm ridiculous. I'll sit in a corner in the corner of my office and everything's marked and color-coded and gone through. And, you know, it's all it's crazy. I'm crazy about it. I'm obsessed. But, um, and so I'll miss whole blocks of movies if they're coming out or being made at a time where I've got a lot going on. And that was one of them. And so I was looking for something to watch. My friend was over. We were hanging out for the weekend. It was just us, you know, and and um, and we pulled that off the shelf. And oh my gosh, we just watched it, and it was so brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I, lo I love good film. I love good film with brilliant actors because brilliant actors keep me engaged. It's not the other things, you know. I mean, it's not the special effects. It's not you know just the storyline. I have to I have to go on a journey, and that's one of the reasons why I work so hard when I'm prepping is because I want to take people on that journey with me. And I know that if I'm not believing it, if I'm not feeling it, if I'm not living it, the people watching it aren't going to be either. And that's one of the things I loved about that movie. It was just brilliant. And, and that's why I'm going to tell you a couple of my favorite actors to watch is um, Meryl Streep. Mm -hmm. I can watch anything she does. She completely is in the moment. She believes everything that she's doing. Even Mamma Mia? I haven't seen I've, Mamma Mia. I haven't seen that either, but yeah. I've seen the in it. I may wait for the one my, my least favorite movie that she did was Ricky and the Flash. Yeah. That said, I liked Ricky and the Flash. I haven't seen the last 20 minutes of it yet because I saw it on an airplane. <laughs> What's your favorite Meryl Streep ones? I mean, mine would still be good, but you're not a big fan of They're all good, but you know who I like even better is um, Daniel Day-Lewis. Yeah. I mean, I can just watch that guy. Yeah, he's brilliant. And I like it when they can take on a different persona. And they make it completely believable. And I get told a lot in interviews, they're like, you know, I saw you in this and I saw you in that, and you don't even look like the same person. I put a great deal of effort into that. Mm -hmm. You know, I make sure they all have different quirks and different tics and different movements and different, you know, everything that I can do in order to make them different from each other. And that's what I like to watch. I like to watch it when you're like, oh my God, I had that no idea that was such and such, you know. It's one of my favorite things. Do you go down to the level of maybe put a stone in your shoes? I can't remember who it was, but somebody did that. They put a stone to give them a little bit of a limp and... Like, wow, that is, not the viewer doesn't know it's it, right. but they did, and it helped them become another character. I've known people that stuck needles in their pocket and stuff. I mean, it goes, it goes to all extremes, yeah. but, you know, that's method acting. But it's to me, I can actually feel where the character's at in the moment. And to give you an example, because Neil Johnson's been, he's in the finishing stages now of, of Rogue Warrior, and I still can't make it through certain scenes without crying. I cannot watch them because I remember everything that she was feeling at the time and all the things that were going And when you see that movie, I mean, it's, it's insane, you know, and I, and I watch it and I start to cry and I'm like, how many times am I going to have to watch this before I don't cry at the premiere? It's going to be a lot because I, I, all of a sudden it just throws me into all the things that I was feeling at the time. And, you know, she has an incredible journey. I mean, she's got lots and lots and lots of different identity things going on. You know, she starts out, she doesn't know who she is, she has no memories, and then she goes to, um, she gets told who she is and what she is, and then she gets, you know, and she has another consciousness that she finds out's uploaded into her, and then, because the movie will be out by the time this comes out, and then her boyfriend dies, and then, um, she, you know, she hears the voices, and all these things are, it's all kind of coming to a, a rumble at the same time, and then, um, and then she decides she can overcome it, but she still doesn't have her identity. And those are very sad things. She's the first character I've ever played that had a harder life than I did. It's a really interesting thing. I mean, there might come a time you might not be able to not cry that thing ever. You know, it's possible. Maybe. It's absolutely possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's intense, too. Like, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's really intense, yeah. 
So when I, and since of course movies are shot out of order and a lot of things were pickup shots or inserted shots later, I mean we shot this thing for six months after principal photography wrapped. And, um, but I had it all where everything, I color coded everything to what she knew, how she was feeling, what people thought of her, what her journey was, what her mission was, what she was up against. And, um, and I had to put a color to each one of those sets so that when we got to that I could throw myself into that. But that had its own um, rewards and its own restrictions too. Because there's a point where if you know where you're at, where you can't out act outside those boundaries. So here you're working with brilliant actors. Like when I worked with William, William Kircher, I was so excited to work that day. But then when I looked at what I knew and where I was at and where, how far along my journey was, it put me in a box. And it, but it ended up being very, very interesting. Very interesting because it, it restricts. Otherwise, you're working with a great actor. If you're a smaller part inside the film, you'd be you know, you'd be like trying to knock it out, you know. But instead, you're held in by what you know, it's all the things that are going on around you. So it's very interesting. Yeah, you being put in that box became made one of the best emotional scenes in the film. It did. When when I watched that film, you know, I think it's the swallow. There's this point where I get told something, and I I can't say anything. Not only do I not have any lines right there, but when you're living a character, you're like, you can't say anything. And then there's this, she swallows, and it always like hits me in my gut. It ended up being a brilliant scene, but it is because I was in that box, and because his performance was so amazing, and we were both living in the moment. Yeah. How easy is it to shake off a character? I mean, other than the conversation we just had with the, I felt like the watching I... of the scene that makes you tearful. In general, is it easy to shake off? No. And it's not easy at all. Um, comedy, yes. Luckily, because I had a week after I shot Jenna before we started this. But um, this was really hard for me to shake off. Um, I was telling everybody around me for a few days, especially Neil, I said, um, I feel like I have PTSD from the last shoot day because I had a really intense scene. And um, I can tell you now because the movie already be out, but you know, it ends with me killing my childhood friend, you know, and, and um, for very good reasons but you know stabbing him in the back with a knife and she was in a very strong emotional state but she had a, a journey and a purpose and I had to go through this over and over for two days filming the scene and afterwards I was just numb I was just numb because I still had all that pain of all that that I'd done and all that feeling and it's always like having PTSD. I would say a few weeks later, it, it kind of started to shake off, but you kind of feel like you've been through a trauma or a breakup or, a, you know, those things that you have very strong emotions with. If you're living it when you're doing it on film and you're doing it right, you're going to have a problem getting over it, just like real life disasters. Yeah. But how easy is it? You've mentioned you've done insert shots and stuff after mm -hmm. the photography route. Mm -hmm. Getting back into that character. Really easy. It's really easy. Really easy, yeah. I know exactly where she's at. I know exactly what the shot's for. And so it's really easy to put myself back in. I actually really look forward to it. It's like, oh, God, I've missed Sienna. You know, because our, our characters become, they're our memories. If, if you have an acting style where you live it. And I got that. I studied with Margie Haber. I'm going to give her a shout-out here. Because she changed my life. And she's the one who... She's, you know, I'd have all, all kinds of method training and all different kinds of, you know, Alexander, everything. And um, study, 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 study. How do you ramp the career up to the next level? And then I worked with Margie for a few years. And she's also Halle Berry's coach. And I coached with her for years on every project. And she said, you just have to live it. Just believe that you're there. Stop using this and using that. And, mm -hmm. and my God, that changed my life. It just absolutely changed my life. Because now when I live characters, they're experiences and what I went through them, those are my memories too. You know, they become part of who you are. I, I call it the birth of a character. Like we decide who they are, we become who they are, we live their lives, but you never forget who they are. They're always inside of you, you know. That always makes me think of Meryl Streep as well, because you mentioned Meryl Streep, you mentioned Daniel B. Lewis mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. So is it not sort of scary I mean, if you get a script and you think that's a really dark character? Mm -hmm. Am I okay with becoming that character? Is there ever a point where it's like, well, oh, because you know you're not going to be able to shake a character off? You know, there was a character that I got offered um, just a few weeks ago. And I don't remember the name of the film because I only considered it for like two hours. Mm -hmm. And I know Mira Servino is one of the leads in it. And it was right after the, I was in um, Who's Jenna with Bill Servino. So I think that might be part of where the connection came from, that I get a call from them. 
And they wanted me to come in, and I asked for a script, and nobody sent a script. So luckily, I knew one of the other cast members that was listed, and I sent over an email. I'm like, hey, can you shoot me over the script? Because I'm supposed to go in and meet with them tomorrow. And he shot me over the script, and I read it. And it was a you know, great film. I didn't get too far through it. But the character, not only was she not really somebody that I was interested in living, you know, but she, um, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was dark, and then she didn't have a huge arc. And I love arcs. I mean, I'm an actress, you know. And so I just called my manager, and I'm like, I got the script from a friend that's in the cast, and I'm going to pass, you know, because I don't want to live that life. I don't want to, that is, isn't going to add anything to my life. You know, it's just going to kind of make me depressed for a while, you know. And I don't need it as a memory. Yeah, so. There is, there's a lot of things, because I speak to a lot of people in class who call themselves film reviewers, film critics, and stuff, mm-hmm. and they'll, they'll watch a film and they're like, they like it. And I always like to remind them that it's me as a film fan or them as a film fan, 90 minutes to watch a mm-hmm. film. Mm-hmm. People that make it, it's months, years, sometimes longer than that, yeah. to, uh, to sort of go through the the journey or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, what's your thoughts on, do you read reviews? Do you, do you listen to podcasts like mine? I do, I love podcasts. Um, I usually read reviews. I'll read them still on some of the bigger studio films. Mm-hmm. Um, I've never read a review of anything that I've done that I didn't like. That said, I've been warned that in science fiction that that's going to change. And so I've read a lot of other science fiction reviews, even of Star Wars, and they do, they really, they're very hard on the characters, you know, very, very hard on people. So I've decided I'm not going to read them, you know, unless, unless my publicist points out something, oh, this is great, you got to see this, then I'll look at that. But I'm even having to do that with social media a little bit, I'm passing that over to them a little bit, just because people are so harsh. I mean, they're just so harsh. But I've never had a negative review of anything that I've done, but I, I know that, you know, people pick apart science fiction because you have fanatical fans out there. So the fans are amazing and um, from what I've been told they kind of hide behind that veil and they put all this negativity out there and I don't need negativity in my life. I work so hard. It's the same with horror films. Horror horror fans are fascinating because they will watch a thousand horror films in five years and they'll hate 980 of them. Yeah. They'll keep watching horror films and I think science fiction fans are similar. Mm -hmm. So they may be a bit harsh but keep going back and they keep watching yeah. every science fiction film that comes out. But that's why it's sort of fascinating and stuff. But the social media thing, it can be quite harsh, I think, because people hide behind. They do. And they can type whatever they want, and I see it a lot. I have a whole list of, of Twitter handles that I've banned from my page. I, I call it report, delete, ban. And it's just, you get so tired of it after a while, because the people who, are, who bash you on social media you can always, if you do enough investigation, figure out kind of who they are. And I've done that with like six of the Twitter handles that I'm sure are all the same person. And um, without saying any names, I'll just say it was funny because the way that we figured it out, because it hurts. You know, you wake up in the morning and somebody's knocking you for something that you have no control over or knocking you because you don't do enough red carpets. I'm sorry, I don't do red carpets unless it's my film or a friend's film. You know, I, I'm just not that person. I'm too busy. You go put on a pretty dress and go, oh, hello, you know, and take my picture and put it in Getty Images. Oh, yeah, now I can put it on social media. That's not me, you know, and um, I'd rather be studying on the next film. Yeah, it's just who I am. And so I um, kept getting these bashings and bashings and bashings and finally noticed that the one thing that this particular person had in common was that the only things that they'd ever liked was of this particular actress that we'd fired from a film before we started shooting. It's like, oh, that's who it is. So we were able to kind of, it isn't the actress, but it's somebody very close to the actress. And we're kind of like, oh, okay. So I've been saving those to collectively report to Twitter. And finally, I had a, a bad one on Facebook. I don't know if you saw it yesterday. No, I've, I've been, I've oh. a little bit of tweeting. Since I did a here, screen but... capture and I posted it. And with this whole like, no body shaming thing, you know, and it was like, really? All I want to be is the best me that I can be. I'm not competing with all you guys. I don't want to know if you think I need a bigger this or a smaller. I don't want to know. You know, it's, that's, that's rude. And um, so I probably should have blacked out the name of the person that posted. It was on my page, you know. But I didn't. I screen capped it and I put it all over social media. And I thought, so then my publicist said to me last night, I think we're going to take care of your social media. <laughs> he, goes, he goes, you can't do that, you know. Which is a shame that it gets to that level, doesn't it, where you go, you know, Deal with that part for yeah. you. Social media should be 
And I love some of it. Yeah. But all they're going to do is take off the negative stuff and report the stuff. And so that's good. But it's just if you're working so hard, the last thing you need is people derailing you all the time. You know, it's like, you know, don't take me off my focus. I have a really big focus. And um, I just don't have time for it. I love the fans. I love the press. I love the friends. I love the followers, you know. But we don't need negativity that we didn't. Not at all. No. There used to be a group on Facebook, and it was something actors network. Mm -hmm. And it was just full of actors who yeah. would spend all day complaining yeah. about why they've not got any work. But they'd be on there all day. Yeah. Oh, nobody's ever given me roles. Well, that's because you're on Facebook all the time. Yeah. You should get, go with that. Study. Mm -hmm. or, you know, do whatever you do to, to get more roles. But they would just constantly complain about everything. And, and the thing is, is that if somebody goes to look at them, because i found a lot of times with people that are hiring me, that they'll look at my social media. And if they see you being negative about anything, they're not going to hire you. No. We do it all the time when we were looking for people for the last two films. It's like the first thing you do once you get the submissions and you have the short list is you Google them. Mm -hmm. And a couple of people that had trashed other people in the press, or you're like, oh, I don't want to work with that person. And then we've worked with people who have, you know, trashed other people, or they burn their bridges, or they get egos, or they, I mean, as an actor, your main job is to be brilliant on film, and your second job is to be kind to people and not to burn any bridges. And, you know, everything else after that is fine, but you'd be surprised how small this industry is. We have a, a my manager had hired an, an actor friend of ours, and um, again, no names mentioned, but... He burned a bridge, and he was hanging out with somebody else who had burned a bridge. And so, to make a long story short, she's not only not representing them, but then they lost their agent who called her to say, hey, why aren't you representing them anymore? And she told them. You know, and it's just that effect. And you have these actors, it's a domino effect. If they do one negative thing, five people are going to find out, 25 people are going to find out from there, and nobody's going to touch them. Okay. And that's why nobody's working with them. You have to be not afraid to pick up the duct tape if you see it in the shot. You have to be not afraid to look at your own continuity, no matter how big the, the show is. You know, you have to, you know, you have to do everything you can to make it a successful project. Yeah. Especially with the independent film world. Yeah. Which is why I love independent films more than the big studio films. Mm -hmm. I do like big things like Star Wars and stuff. Oh, of course. I love all these, you know, indie films, Blue Ruin and, and all, you know, all these type of movies that generally a lot of people don't know about because they don't end up on the front of every magazine, mm -hmm. they don't end up on the side of buses or you know, massive billboards on skyscrapers and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I like helping publicize those, but it's a, it is a really small world. It's a really small world. Especially the independent side of things. Yeah. I spoke to people and I go, oh, I've watched this film by this other person. Go, oh, I had lunch with them yesterday. And I'm like, wow. Yeah. Oh, it's you yeah. know, you'll get a message from Neil going, oh, listen to your podcast. <laughs> and then you message me going, yeah, I've heard that on your podcast. Like, you listen to the podcast. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's it's a really small world, yeah. And, you know, we see the actors that come in by, by the busloads, and then we see the busloads that leave. And they all have the same thing in common. They weren't willing to put the work in. They all blame it on somebody else. They all leave with this long dirt list. But... You know, we see it happen. You know, they go in for an audition. Everybody's messaging everybody. Do you know if we have to be off book? Mm -hmm. Why would you go to an audition if you couldn't be off book and if you couldn't live it and be brilliant at it? Because you're in front of somebody who not only could give you a job today, they give you a job tomorrow, they give you, give you a job next year, they give you a job in five years. You may never get to see them again. I don't even go to something. I haven't been to an audition in years, but I wouldn't go to one if I didn't know I could be brilliant mm -hmm. because no there's no point. So they go in day after day doing as little as they can. You know, somebody's told them they had a great look. Some acting teacher that they paid $400 a month to for three years keeps telling them how wonderful they are. And then they'll go in with their paper in their hand, da, 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 and they don't get the job. It's consistently, 100% consistent. Yeah. And you then they leave. It. Work hard at it. You have to want it. Yeah. You have to want it so badly that if you, you know, have a party planned that afternoon and a dinner planned that night and you get an audition for the next morning, you cancel everything. You sit down and you put the work in. And if you don't put the work in, the person who's going to get that part is the person who put the work in. Not necessarily the best look, but the person who put the work in. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was fortunate enough to be on three film sets in 2015. Mm -hmm. And the first one that was on was a film called Witch. 
I don't wait there. It's only maybe only two or three lines, and I'm not an actor by any means, but I can talk. So I, <laughs> I don't mind cameras being pointed at me. And there was one of the one of my acting colleagues there. Mm-hmm. He's trying to go through some of the lines. He'd been going through these hours and hours and going through them. And he said, "Do you want to go through the lines?" I went, "No, I think I've got." Mm-hmm. Yeah, really? Sure, you don't want to practice them before? And I'm like, "No, I'll be okay." Mm-hmm. And then we did it. That was terrible. <laughs> but I learned from it and then the next one I was on I'm like right now now I get this working hard part it's not just a case of yeah, I can remember that and then do it because there's, mm-hmm. there's so much more to, to do in the lines if you only have a few lines mm-hmm. go through them 500 to 1000 times mm-hmm. what's I mean why not we're, we're not all Dennis Hopper. <laughs> you know, I, I worked with Dennis Hopper on The Prophets Came a long, long time ago. I saw that film. Did you? Yeah, I had that in my video story. Yeah. And what was so funny was that he... Um, I learned a trick from every great actor I work with. And what I learned from him was, you know, of course they had him run to a certain point and then a double ran around the building, you know, and then he came back out the front. But he didn't even know his lines. He had a really hard time memorizing he just taped him on the back of the guy in front of him. And he said he did it in um, Blue Velvet, too. Taped it underneath the coffee table. You know, and it's like, okay, you don't always need to know that. But I did get a head injury once, and I had a film shoot a few days later. And I called the director, and I'm like, I'd gone to the emergency room. I'd landed on my head, which I do somewhat frequently, probably <laughs> once at least every year or two. No, I'm well, no, I'm just really morning. physical, yeah. you know. And um, this particular time, I was trying to do push-ups you know the handstand push-ups? Because I saw Casper Ka- Bendy and the friend of mine was doing them at the gym. I'm like, I bet I could do that, right? So I wait till nobody's in the gym and I go over in the corner, put my feet up against the wall and I get up in a handstand and I'm like starting to do it. Well, just then my trainer had walked around the corner, thought I was going to hurt myself and grab my ankles. But I didn't see him. So I fell and I landed on my head. So my brain swelled and, you know. So anyway, so <laughs> I was having a problem remembering my lines and it was getting better and better and better. And... Um, I called the director and I'm like, you know, I know I'm going to be okay on the second day. What I'm worried about is on the first day. You know, is there any possibility he could flip things around? Oh no, you'll be okay. He was a, he was a newbie director at the time. So I thought, what would what would any of these great actors that I've worked with do? And I'm thinking like, what do I do? What do I do? And my thinker's not working. You know, and I remember Dennis Hopper. So it was a restaurant scene. <laughs> so in the menu, I put my lines. So if I forgot anything, I just held my menu up. So he comes up to me about halfway through and he goes. You look like you're reading. You know, it's just at one part. And I go, well, I was looking down at my line because I told you my brain wasn't working. He goes, oh, okay, we'll do that a couple more times then. But really, it looks great in the film. Mm. You know, it was like, so I learned that from him. The viewer doesn't see that. No. So, you know, nobody knew that Marlon Brando was doing that sort of thing in Superman, you know, taping yeah. his lines to people's forehead. It's really the only time that I've done it. I'm embarrassed to say that I've done it, but I had no tools left. When your brain's swollen and you have a head injury... Mm-hmm. What do you do? You know, so I'm not going to try any more handstand push-ups, no, no, okay? Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, you always learn something. Well, that, I suppose that's the whole thing. You, you're learning. If you stop learning, stop mm-hmm. then. You know, if you stop getting better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if I get to work with somebody who's a great actor, sometimes I don't realize what I took away from them for a long time. And then I start thinking of how what I learned from them permeated into me, and then I'm like, oh, that's where I got that from. But then I remember the first time I was acting like that. Yeah. Is there anything really scary about acting? For you, something that's like, that's the part I don't like. There's no weeping angels in acting no unless I get angels. Doctor Who. So yeah. it's like... <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, Doctor Who. it's the only thing they that scares me. <laughs> Would that, if you've got a script through, it's like, right, you're now surrounded by 40 weeping angels, and this is the film for the full... I'd still do it. I'd still do it. I go past my fears. It's like I've been told to do lots of things before, especially by Neil, where it's like, okay, and I think it through, and I think about through the possibilities, and I'm like, okay, I'll do it. You know, you just got to think it all through. So we've mentioned Neil a few times, and turns what's he like to work with? It's embarrassed the guy. <laughs> <laughs> He's a tough one to embarrass. Um, a true actor's director. A true collaborator, um, which is one of the best things about working with him, is that if I come up with an idea and I talk to him about it, he'll think about it. Sometimes I go, nah, nah, nah. You know, <laughs> it's like he didn't even listen to me. You know? And then sometimes it's like, yeah, we'll try that, or yeah, okay. You know, and as an actor, you get ideas that can help the overall product. But a lot of directors have this ego, 
and you'll say to them, you know, oh, what about this? Okay, well, no. You know, and they won't even think about it. Neil wants his film to be the very best film it can possibly be. And so not only in that way is he an actor's director, but also in the way that when he does the, once the characters are cast, he'll go back and do a whole rewrite because he realizes what those cast members can bring to the table. And um, so then it's more towards who they are and their personality. And I would, I mean, I've said it before, Rogori is a definite character-driven science fiction. And what was so cool was we were all like living it because we'd all had the chance to collaborate with him. And, but he, he is a little bit punishing. And I, I will say that. Like, it's like. Days, long days or just like, can't wait to just jump off a cliff as well? Over and over and over and over again, especially like falling off the speeder bike. It's like my hips were aching. I had bruises all over. I was rolling over these rocks. You know, everything's sharp. Everything hurt. It's 110 degrees, you know. And this was a long time ago, but. And it's like, man. And he's like, no, I want to do it this way. Let's try it this way. Let's try that. And you're like, I just did that like 50 times, you know. But in the end, that's what looks the best. And so I have no complaints. No complaints. Can I stop you a second? Oh, okay. I think I yeah, vibrated a minute ago, didn't I? Yeah. Okay. I didn't want to stop the flow. <laughs> no, it's fine. That was still right. Okay. And um, yeah, one of the great things that happens now again is cameras stop. Just Who needs them? Um... <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Welcome round. This one's still good. Fantastic. Um, yeah, falling off speaker bikes. Yeah. Oh. Those are rough tumbles with explosions going on. I mean, there's a lot happening all at the same Actual time. And you're in the desert, and my costuming for that is a cutout, like, neoprene outfit with a leather jacket and boots. So a lot of ice was destroyed in the making of this movie. I was soaking wet, literally whole bags of ice down in my outfit, and I was still dying. You know, you really feel like you're dying, but you keep going because the camera's rolling. And the director's going, great, great, now try this. You're like, okay, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> you know? I mean, we're in a pretty warm room now. You've got mm -hmm. the, ice there, the ice. I've got my eyes. How long have you had the ice? I've trick? been holding my eyes. Not drinking, just holding, yeah. Have you had that trick for a while? The ice trick? Um, I overheat really easily. Yeah, so I, have, I forget what it's called. It starts with an A, but it's a condition where I only sweat from my belly button and the back of my neck. So even at the gym, I'm always turning on the big fans and everything, and they're like, everybody else doesn't want them on. I'm like, I don't care. I'm lifting heavy. I need fresh air, yeah, and water. Right. I'm going to start adopting that trick. Of <laughs> Especially the San Diego. Like, hold it for a minute. You'll see how much cooler you get. Just for a minute. It does, but you do the kangaroo thing. Do you know the kangaroo trick? No. No. He's, uh, I love kangaroos. So used to do it. <laughs> I think I saw the documentary where kangaroos would, would lick their wrists. So if you put cold water or run a tap over that part, it mm -hmm. in the entire bloodstream. Part mm. it. Yeah, just holding that will keep you cool. It works. Yeah. Otherwise, I'd need a powder person and, you know, fans. fans. Stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how was this year being for, how was 2016 being for you then? Mm -hmm. Other than very busy? Busier than I've ever been and my best year ever, I would say. It's been my most fun I've ever had. Yeah. Until 2017, which will be even better. It'll be even better. Every year's been better than the last for the last few years. It just keeps getting better and better. And, um... I think making the movies is more fun than them coming out, but I'm so excited for them coming out. I just can't even believe it. But one other thing I wanted to talk about with um, science fiction. Yeah. One of my favorite parts about it is, is using my imagination. Because, as you know, a few of the characters, especially one in particular, um, Hoagland, is, you know, he's, he's a robot. And all of that gets done in post later. Now, we have a physical robot, and he's in some of the shots, but a lot of that comes in later. And one of my favorite things was creating Hoagland in my mind. Because in order for me to say those lines, and this was the trickiest thing when I'm looking at the script, it's like, how am I going to make this believable? I'm talking off to thin air or something on a green stick or whatever, you know? And um, so Neil had a really good idea, and he gave me Hoagland to sit in my office. So for months, I talked to him, and I developed his personality. And I developed his quirks, and I developed what his voice sounded like, and we kind of created this relationship, me and this robot. And it's really pretty funny when people are like, what is that? And I'm like, that's my robot, you know? And so we get to the set, and by this point, Hoagland was real to me, and I knew his personality, I knew everything about him. Get to the set, and people start reading Hoagland's lines for you to bounce off of. And I was like, that doesn't sound like Hoagland. And I, I was like, it was a real stumbling block for me, you know? It's like, because it wasn't what I expected. So then we got to the point where after a while... 
I had to memorize Hoagland's lines for the pacing just so that I could play them in my mind, but it was still more real to me than having another voice. And then, of course, now it has a whole other voice to it, but that's okay because we got what we needed out of me. But I think that's the most interesting thing. And even fighting in the desert with certain things that weren't there that got put in later. Some things were there, some things weren't. Um, it's all in your imagination. It's even more fun than watching science fiction is creating it in your mind and actually having it be real to you. It was so exciting, so much fun, such a challenge, but really, really cool. Sounds like a challenge. I don't know if I don't remember my own lines, let alone another character. That yeah. Well, it does exist in your mind, but hasn't yet been created. But you have to make it real for the viewer. Yeah, so much work. So much work, yeah. Well, it's a difficult thing with science fiction, isn't it? You've got to mm -hmm. keep more sci-fi fans happy. Yeah, so much fun, though. More fun than watching it mm -hmm. is to create it in your own mind. I think yeah. I'll stick to watching it. <laughs> it works for me. I'll stick to watching movies and then talking about it. It's good to be polite. So, so thank you very much for taking the time. To have a conversation. It's been absolutely fantastic. Your ice hasn't melted yet, which is good. Cheers. Good. <laughs> and uh, thank you to the first camera for running out, but thankfully the second camera, wonderfully operated by Neil Johnson. The podcaster. The podcaster. <laughs> yeah, Neil Johnson show. So thank you very thank much. Thank you. What we did to his daughter, it was obscene. Robots are changing protocols. The Scourge. They've declared martial law, downloading memories with big brain suckers. The AI Scourge has been planning our genocide. We have maybe less than a month. There's a planet near the galactic core called Abyss. They knocked down the central brain unit with Hawking radiation bombs. It's like a big off switch. We can't go running all over the galaxy looking for some mythical fix-all. A clever girl would steal one of Ralston's shuttles to see if there's any bombs left on it.